Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce this uh, symposium on uh, Kurt Ludwig's impressive book, um, which proceeds from an event causal analysis of intentional individual action to an original analysis of collective action. Uh, I guess that many of you have read the book. I know that uh, there are a few people in the audience, at least three, who have written and published or for, uh, or, or have uh, reviews forthcoming or, or published on the book, Ulle and Matthias and Raimo. Um, yeah, I will leave uh, the panel to talk about the content of the book. Uh, the panelists are Raimo Tuomela from University of Helsinki and uh, Sarah Chan from Tulane University and Michael Schmitz from University of Vienna in, in that order. And we can continue until a quarter past six, and uh, after that there will be a reception in our staff dining room, which is just above this room. Okay, Simon? Okay, thank you very much. I have a uh, paper here, so, so something written on, on, on the uh, as a, as a paper, but it actually uh, did a presentation in uh, with slides on it. Uh, of it, uh, I, I published a, a review of this book in in the Notre Dame Journal of uh, Reviews in uh, when was it? Maybe April or something of of the, of the kind uh, this year. Anyway, anyhow, so uh, <coughs> I've, I've drawn a little bit from that that uh, re review here. Now, let's see. <coughs> the mic is not on. The what? I think it's on. If you, if you look a little closer to the mic. Oh, I see. You can't hear me. Okay. Is it on? Yes, it's on. No. no. It's on. It's on, but you have to speak quite close to it. Oh, I see. So, how about now? <laughs> 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 Good. So let me go go ahead. Uh, I have uh, some f uh, about twelve slides here. I'll read them all. It makes life easier for me and hopefully for you to 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 do it this way. Uh, Ludwig's uh, book is an exceptionally well-argued, high-level contribution to analytic single-agent and plural-agent action theory. Social groups are viewed as plural subjects in the present volume. Uh, there's going to be a second volume later. Well, actually, this coming fall. Um, well, they're okay. And uh, the plural subjects <coughs> ontologically consist of a collection of single agents who generally are capable of shared we intending that they act together. Below I will briefly present the main ideas and theses in, in Ludwig's uh, account and criticize some of them uh, also, but uh, my criticisms are very mild. I have not elaborated or, or the criticism. There may be sources for a bigger dispute, but uh, here I'll I'll try to be very, very peaceful. So. <coughs> the first part of Ludwig's, uh, Ludwig's, Ludwig's, uh, for, for Swedish-speaking people, is, this is Ludwig, or, and then for English-speaking people, this is Ludwig. <laughs> and, and for German-speaking people, it's Ludwig. <laughs> that, uh, that was not meant as a joke, but maybe it sounds like a joke. <laughs> Um, Ludwig's book develops an analysis of individual action, agency, and intention, with special focus uh, on the logical form of singular action sentences and the logical role of the modifier intentionally in action sentences. In the account is built on a refinement and extension of uh, Donald Davidson uh, famous event analysis of singular action sentences. In Ludwig's account, the action verb is viewed as introducing two quantifiers of events. Uh, thus, to say, for instance, that an agent melted the chocolate, this is uh, Ludwig's own example, uh, is to say roughly that he did, that he brought about an event, 
Oh, An event that in turn caused uh, th that uh, chocolate melted. So, producing, uh, melting the uh, presupposes that the agent does something, brings about a certain event which ha in causes that the uh, chocolate melts. A central achievement of the book is that it gives detailed and innovative technical representations of many central notions and phenomena that action theory is about. In the second part, this book develops an account of plural discourse about collective action and intention. The focus is on the logical form of plural action sentences in this part. We built the bridge is a, would be an example of such a sentence. And on sentences attributing we intentions to action. For instance, we intended to build the bridge. As well as on the content of individuals intentions, that is we intentions, when they are participating in joint intentional action. Plural action sentences are typically ambiguous between a distributive and collective reading where the ambiguity is due to scope ambiguity rather than lexical ambiguity concerning intending or the main verb in question. Uh, suppose we sang, uh, sang a certain song, for instance our national anthem. It could mean two things. That uh, first, that we each did so. This is the distributive reading. Or a saying that we did so together. This is a collective reading. On the distributive reading, for each of us, and this is what Ludwig says about the matter. I, this is nothing of my own here. For, e for each of us, there is an event of which the person is the sole agent. And this event is the singing of the song. And in the collective case, they, they do it. Not together, but th there is a collection of persons who all do this thing and are, are agents of the end result that the song gets sung by them. The <coughs> we get the collective reading essentially by reversing the order of the quantifiers. There is an event that is a singing of the song of which each <coughs> of us is an agent. Here group agency involves multiple agents of a single event, not an event of which there is a single agent. Here, uh, the we here is not a group agent in Ludwig's account, only the members of the we, that is the group that we may call the group here. The, oh, sorry, <laughs> only the members of the we <coughs> are agents of anything. So you see the see the basic idea here. Uh, I think there's nothing more that is needed here for that. Ludwig claims that fundamental. And uh, now we go to big questions in uh, problems in principle. But he claims that the fundamental understanding of the social requires an understanding of the nature of collective agency and of how the various aspects of the social world are grounded in it. Ludwig's goal is to provide an account of the basic conceptual structures that are involved in collective agency. And for him, the foundational understanding of social reality depends on understanding the nature of collective intentional behavior and how it differs from individual intentional behavior. I accept this and uh, there is not, not much to criticize here. I, I say some, maybe some qualifications might be needed, but we, we soon come to that and precisely now. Ludwig relies on two basic uh, principles. First, an account of collective intentional behavior should be built on an understanding of individual intentional behavior. 
and more complex forms of in collective institutional behavior should be understood in terms of more basic forms of collective intentional behavior. So uh, the building ground uh, the, uh, is, is always individual action and what can be and principles by which uh, something more complicated uh, can, can be built out of them. So this is a form of individualism. Second, the account should be built on a proper understanding of the logical form of the sentences we use to express our thoughts about collective action, shared intentions, and collective intentional behavior. Laying bare the logical form of our discourse, says Ludwig, will tell us the fundamental ontology of the domain studied. Now my question here is, but is logical f form indeed prior to ontology as it here seems to be? And here is a point that might be developed, developed further, but I, I'm not, um, I don't have time to go into those questions now. Next. We intentions, in Ludwig's account, are intentions that an individual has when intentionally functioning as a group member in a group. Ludwig claims on page, uh, in the book, that we can understand the difference between I intentions, inten that is, intentions an individual can have when he's not acting as a group member, and we intention related to collective action on the basis of concepts which are already in play in understanding individual intentional action. So here is the in individualistic pr principle uh, doing some work again. <coughs> but I doubt this claim myself. Uh, yet, uh, uh, I don't, if you read my social ontology book uh, of 2013, uh, I have some criticism of this kind of uh, ideas. Uh, but uh, here are uh, Ludwig is very consistent in his views, and, and uh, so you have to criticize the whole approach if you have, have criticisms against, against some uh, special claims. <coughs> um, I, well, I'm saying here that I doubt this claim, yet it is left open here what understanding the individual case exactly requires, so that is something one can begin with if one wants to criticize this view. In Ludwig's account, a group acts intentionally when its members intend that they perform the parts of a joint action and carry out their intentions successfully. So this is a sufficient condition for intentional action by, by <coughs> plural subject groups. Uh, this seems indeed right for plural subject groups, but not for groups in which authorized members exist for plan formation, uh, etc. Thus, if a plural subject group acts intentionally, it rather trivially entails that its members act intentionally. Plural subject groups are not agents, according to Ludwig, basically because they cannot perform primitive actions or basic actions in older terminology uh, and cannot have their ray intentions towards such, such actions. That I accept. Uh, yet I have argued that in certain un unstructured groups there are that are plural subject groups, they can be agent in an approximative sense that the meriological sum of its members, uh, members' actions involves um, some formulation problems in that sentence, but I hope it's clear enough. Ludwig assumes that the logical form of collective action descriptions contain central information uh, about the ontology of collective action and relevant mental notions. This, in, in a way, was already said. Uh, much as we do it in our common, fo common folk psychology, is this a, a tenable uh, assumption? So is ontology importantly dependent on <coughs> on, on uh, logical forms and things like this. Uh, it seems to ignore the criticisms of folk psychology, because the descriptions and uh, things are, this information is, is 
related to folk psychological ideas. So criticism of folk psychology and people's common intuitions and views. Uh, the criticism old, already in, in a way old criticism by Stitch from the was it 70s, 80s and Radcliffe and others. <coughs> I'm not claiming here that Ludwig uncritically accepts folk psychological claims, but the, but the above criticism, if right, might well affect the social ontology that his theory builds on. But this is just a, uh, not a, seri a seriously argued claim here. I, I don't have a very good argument so, so for it, so I didn't write m more about that thing here. But that's sort of my intu intuition about the matter. We intention is a central element in Ludwig's account and also in my own account that employs thick, I say thick we mode, we intentions. So we mode, we intentions which are in the we mode. I have to do a, a little bit explaining uh, if you don't know this notion of we mode. Uh, there's at least somebody in the front who does not I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> this was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> and my account does not agree with L L Ludwig's thesis that we intentions should be analyzed solely on the basis of concepts which are already in play in understanding individual intentional action. Groups may be de needed, uh, group notions may be needed uh, too, so <coughs> in my, according to me. The we mode is in is with us is with us in many cases of collective thinking and acting. Uh, sometimes I say that we we learn the we mode in in uh, from our mother's milk already. But this is just not a very seriously worked out thing. Uh, people are not only typically. I continue. People are not only typically cooperative but also disposed to act together in the we mode. Anecdotal evidence from ordinary life and also some experimental work supports this intuitive claim. I could give some references here to Col Coleman. There are also arguments from game theory to the same effect. Of course, one may think that game theory is game theory and it's just a normative theory. It doesn't have to describe reality properly and, and so on. But um, I, I'm still saying that there are uh, arguments of this kind uh, in game, uh, game theory arguments that I have taken rather seriously. For instance, in my 2013 OUP book, uh, Social Ontology, I've been arguing that we mode, we intentions are in many cases with the parity and collective action dilemmas needed for empirically best outcomes of social action and interaction. Okay. Ludwig's account of we intentions in terms of their content may be acceptable for his what I call thin notion of we intending, thin as compared with my what I call thick uh, no, we mode we intentions. But it does not capture, for instance, my notion of thick, well, that has a door, we mode intention, that builds on taking the groups, the subjects, which is a subject uh, uh, view to be primary, and also involves strong groupish and togetherness features in addition to the content features of uh, thin we intentions. Let me say here that the subject here is the subject of of a we mode, what I call a we mode group. It's a group that can act. And, and so it, it, I think Ludwig's criticism against groups, uh, groups as, as a subject does not apply to this particular case. Okay, I have two, two one, one long sentence left. These features are in part incorporated into the group social manner or way of behaving as a we and they can be part of the satisfaction conditions and thus the content uh, of, uh, of the we mode, we intention. I think, uh, no, I have a 12th. Can I use 30 seconds for this one? <laughs> I have recently sketched the we mode as a logically second order attitude covering ordinary first order attitudes like belief and, and uh, intention and want and so on. 
and as related to the way uh, or manner of doing things and as fulfilling uh, also some re extra requirement uh, my, which I have required in my mentioned book. The group reads on the collective commitment and collectiv collectivity requirements as I call them and possibly some uh, phenomenological uh, uh, requirements. Uh, my, my recent uh, account uh, has appeared in, in a book edited by re recent book uh, edited by Prayer and Peter, Social Ontology and Collective Intentionality. Uh, this kind of we mode, we intentions are needed at least in some full cases of jointly intentionally uh, performed collective action. That's my claim. Have, has been my claim, and I try to argue for it. My account is uh, at least in part based. Uh, uh, in part as uh, to be understood as a subject account in, a co in addition to being also content-based. Okay, that I suppose ends my slide, so I have to stop here. Okay, thank you. Alrighty, um, so my paper is called Ludwig's Universalism about Collective Action, and I'm just going to read it from here since I can't really walk well. Um, my comments aim to show that like universalism about material objects, Ludwig represents a position, what I'm calling universalism about collective action, that's not typically appreciated in collective action theory. Um, I'm going to suggest that his view is a consequence of a widely appreciated assumption shared by the vast majority of collective action theorists, uh, one that I take to be a mistake. And I argue that his response to my two good boy scouts case is mistaken, and thus it raises a concern for his overall theory. So first I want to explain how Ludwig's theory, and I'm going to call you Kirk from here on out because that's how we do it USA style. Um, entails uh, helping two little old ladies cross the street is a collective action and then I'm going to go on to make some comments. So one, I'm just going to give you some bullet points because I have to do that for myself. Kirk's analysis of collective action sentences reveals an ambiguity between a collective and distributive reading. We built a boat might be each of us built a boat, the distributive reading or there is a boat building event of which we're both agents, the collective reading. Uh, what is it for each of us to be agents of the boat building event? It's for each of us to have performed actions that contributed to the boat building event. The collective reading of, <laughs> the collective reading of, we build a boat is true just in case some boat building event understood to be stripped away of implications of agency, all that good stuff, came about from the direct contributions of multiple agents, namely all and only members of us. Kirk says in general that, quote, the paradigmatic way of answering the question uh, about what a group did is to provide a collective action sentence that expresses what event it is that every member of the group is an agent of and in what way. So there is a boat building event. We each contributed uh, to it by our own individual actions and hence we built a boat. Uh, there's no reference to a group agent or group level intention of any kind, nor is there any reference to individual intentions to contribute to the boat building of a boat. Five. But if it's possible to explain the boat building event without referring to any group level intention or indeed any intention to be part of the individual uh, to contribute to be uh, to a building of a boat, uh, then the same analysis will apply to a very large number of events that are the result of more than one individual action. Even events that would not normally be called by almost any of us collective actions. So consider an event that is the myriological sum of individual actions. There is a true collective action sentence that expresses how the event was brought about by those individual actions. Hence, there are very many true collective action sentences and therefore a vast number of collective actions. So although this puts his account in conflict with many other theories, uh, as well as with many people's intuitions here. Kirk accepts all of these counterintuitive consequences, but gives us a very independent defense of them, which is 
awesome. <laughs> uh, let's take the specific example that Kirk discusses, is a really quite interesting example. Um, two Boy Scouts who each help a little old lady across the street. So in the example he talks about these Boy Scouts, um, the boys don't plan or coordinate. They're on opposite sides of the town. Uh, they don't constitute a group agent and the like. I use that example uh, in a, a different paper to suggest that there are many cases in which individual agents perform individual actions without having thereby performed a collective action. In other words, I deny in my work universalism about collective action, but since one could provide a collective action sentence that expresses what event it is, the event of helping two little old ladies across the street, that every member of an agent of the group is an agent of and in what way, then on Kirk's view, two good Boy Scouts performed a collective action. And because Kirk thinks providing such a sentence is trivial for any collection of actions, universalism for Kirk about collective action is true. As Kirk says, if I'm right, then he's wrong. Uh, so Kirk must show why helping two little old ladies across the street is in fact a collective action, despite at least my intuition. Now, remember again that my two good Boy Scouts case, it, uh, each of the two Boy Scouts helps a different little old lady across the street. The Boy Scouts have no particular beliefs about each other. They did not plan or coordinate their behavior in any way. I suggest that we would not think that helping two little old ladies cross the street picks out a collective action performed by two, uh, two good Boy Scouts. It's merely a way of referring to two individual actions. Now, Kirk argues against this judgment with the following line of reasoning. He says, consider a variant of the case in which the two good Boy Scouts do coordinate their actions, perhaps by meeting in advance and forming a plan to help two little old ladies each day for a month. In this case, Kirk says, and I think correctly, that we would judge that they have thereby performed a collective action. But Kirk goes on to point out that the only difference between the two cases is that in the latter behavior is intentional and in the former, in my case, it is not. And so the only difference in judgment between the two cases ought to be that in the latter we have a collective intentional action while in the former we have a collective unintentional action. Both are collective actions but despite the fact that one, uh, uh, despite the fact that only one is intentional. So contrary to my assertion, we ought to judge in two good Boy Scouts, a collective action has been performed. Um, if you don't feel comfortable with the Boy Scouts having performed collective action, like I don't, Kirk has a response that's supposed to make you feel better. In case you're really tense at this point. Um, when we use language that seems to refer to a collective action, we conversationally imply that those actions have something in common, usually we imply that they were planned or coordinated in some way. But that's merely conversational implicature. We act, re react negatively to calling the Boy Scouts behavior a collective action because it would be wrong to conversationally imply a level of coordination that does not exist. But if we put aside the conversational implicature, there's no logical reason to resist the claim that the two good Boy Scouts have performed a collective unintentional action. Now in my paper, Unintentional Collective Action, I distinguish between two ways in which a collective action may be unintentional. Roughly, a collective action is weakly unintentional under some description if the event mentioned in the description was not intentionally brought about, but there's some description under which it was so intentional. For example, if a group of people sing the national anthem intentionally, thereby annoying my dog, which was unintentional, then annoying my dog is a weakly unintentional collective action. Now, a strongly unintentional collective action, in contrast, is one where there's no description at all under which the collective action was intentional, save our constructing a description like S1's intentionally bringing about S, uh, bringing about a and S2 is intentionally bringing about B um, and assuming some kind of like agglomerativity of intention. 
Um, the original version of the two good Boy Scouts example, if Kirk's argument is sound, would be an example of a strongly unintentional collective action, not a weakly unintentional collective action, because there's no description of their collective action under which it's intentional. The simplicity of Kirk's argument belies the fact that his conclusion would be forcefully rejected by almost everyone in collective action theory for the simple reason that most theories of collective action are flatly incompatible with the existence of strongly unintentional collective actions. This is because typical theories of collective action stipulate that a set of behaviors of different agents qualifies as a collective action only if a collective intention played the right kind of role in bringing it about. Of course, these theories disagree about how to define collective intention, but they all agree that a group level intention is necessary for the performance. Thus, every collective action will have some description under which it's intentional, and so the vast, uh, uh, I'm sorry, and so the very concept of a strongly unintentional collective action is incoherent. In fact, most writers on collective action would say that Kirk's variant of two, the two good Boy Scouts is irrelevant to the question of whether the original case is a collective action because one cannot simply add or subtract collective intention from the case and maintain its status as a collective action. Collective intention is necessary. The obvious challenge for a, uh, for a view that allows for strongly unintentional collective actions is how to draw a non-arbitrary distinction between collective actions and mere collections of actions. This is what I've called elsewhere the first problem of collective action theory. Without having recourse to collective intention, it's not clear that there's any meaningful distinction anymore between collective actions and mere collections of actions. But Kirk bites the bullet here. He says every myriological sum of actions perform performed by more than one agent, or he's committed to rather, uh, could count as a collective action. That is, as you'll recall, so long as one can provide a collective action sentence that expresses what event it is that every member of the group is an agent of, da da da, then the group has performed a collective action. Thus, for Kirk, not only are there strongly unintentional collective actions, but as I read them, there are infinitely many. Um, and so there are, they are just commonplace. In this respect, Kirk's theory could be no further from the mainstream of collective action theory or Davidson's coarse-grained approach to individuation. Now, given this disagreement, it's useful to step back and ask how, um, what is so obvious to Kirk, and to me for that matter, that's the secret, <laughs> namely the possibility of strongly unintentional collective actions uh, could be so obviously false to others. Uh, this is a useful question to ask because it highlights, or its answer highlights an important but often overlooked issue that's at the core of collective action theory. The issue is how closely analogous group level concepts ought to be to their individual level counterparts. Whenever a collective intent, or whatever a collective intention would be, the only way for it to be a useful concept worthy of the name intention would be for it to resemble an individ individual intention in important ways. Otherwise, we would have no good reason to call it a collective intention at all. And so Kirk asks us to consider the requirements that must be satisfied if something uh, is to be capable of having an intention. Clearly, having an intention requires beliefs and desires, and so an account of collective intention owes us a theory of collective beliefs and collective desires, which is not straightforward. But worse yet, the capacity to have beliefs and desires requires other capacities that groups clearly do not possess. For example, it requires the ability to have concepts, and they may even require a capacity for language. Although the individual members of a group typically have those capacities, it seems like a category mistake to assert that groups do. And as Kirk correctly points out, the mere fact that there are that the parts of a system have a certain property or a certain capacity in no way entails that the whole system does. So it would be a fallacy of composition to claim that groups have, for example, beliefs, desires, concepts, and the capacity for language merely because its members do. This argument actually requires a very interesting and widespread methodological assumption 
uh, one which I believe gets far too little attention in the literature. And this is assumption. This assumption is what is that whatever a collective intention turns out to be, if it exists at all, it would have to be analogous to individual intention. Kirk's argument assumes that the required analogy is very strong to the extent that if an individual intention has a necessary condition, then its collective counterpart must meet that same necessary condition. For example, because an individual intention requires individual belief, perhaps, a collective intention must re uh, require a collective belief, and if an individual intention requires an individual to have certain concepts, then life lies for the collective, and so on. Elsewhere, I've called this the wash, rinse, and repeat approach to collective action theory. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. It amounts to the methodological assumption that we are to construct a theory of collective action by modeling it after the best accounts of individual action. Kirk appears uh, to believe, and I would agree with him, that wash, rinse, and repeat is not a methodology that ought to be followed blindly because the necessary analogy between individual action theory and collective action theory leads to highly implausible consequences. Now, of course, nobody in, collective, in the collective action literature actually believes the unreasonable proposition that collective intentions are exactly like, well, <laughs> I was going to say nobody, but there are a couple of people, um, individual <laughs> intentions, or that the analogy between collective and individual intention never breaks down, Surely even the most dedicated proponent of collective action and intention would allow that collective intentions are importantly different from individual intentions, and specifically uh, uh, that the necessary conditions for having an individual intention aren't identical to those for having a collective intention. So is Kirk tilting at windmills by arguing against a position that nobody holds? Uh, I don't think so. I see his argument as a challenge to collective action theorists to answer the question, how close must the analogy between individual and collective intention be? There's a dilemma implied by this challenge which seems to be the following. If the analogy is a close one, then collective intention is not a viable concept, as Kirk has argued. But if the analogy is not so close, then we have little reason to call them collective intentions at all. The only way through the dilemma is to identify a middle ground where the analogy is close enough to warrant using the term collective intention, but not so close as to have implausible consequences for the theory. Furthermore, that middle ground must give us a way to define terms like collective intention that's interesting and useful. Kirk argues that no such middle ground exists because if there are no useful explanatory categories identified by because there are no useful explanatory categories identified by group level concepts. The reason for this is that in order for those terms to be useful, we'd have to rigorously define them, presumably by making recourse to organizational structures and group dynamics. But if such rigorous definitions were available, then we could explain everything we want in terms of those underlying structures without bothering with group level concepts in the first place. So I'm going to call this, almost done, the usefulness argument, uh, or UA. UA is where Kirk and I part company. I'm skeptical of it because if it were sound, it would imply that we ought to dispose of a large number of very useful explanatory concepts. It's common for two different kinds of systems to share certain high-level properties that figure into a very useful explanations. And this can be so even when those high-level properties are well understood. And we could, in principle, do the explanatory work by citing the underlying structures that gave rise to those properties. Take, for example, the concept of an equilibrium. Uh, a <coughs> system state is said to be in an equilibrium if it's likely to remain in that state or return to it even if there are external shocks or other changes. A ball resting, of course, in the bottom of a bowl is an equilibrium because it will return to the bottom even after it's been pushed. A social institution may be in equilibrium if the group's behavior is stable even if membership in the group changes and the like. It's easy to list examples of equilibria across a range of domains Clearly, even if we fully understand the mechanisms that cause something to be in equilibrium, it does not imply that equilibrium is not a useful or important explanatory concept. 
For one thing, the fact that two different kinds of systems play or display equilibrium behavior allows us to see similarities that might not otherwise be apparent. This enables us to use the same explanatory strategies across the different domains. The important question is whether collective intention, collective belief, and other concepts might be defined in such a way as to play a similar explanatory role. Uh, specifically, we can um, define group level concepts in such a way that we can use the same type of explanation for both group and individual level phenomena. And if so, then we will have our way past the usefulness argument and thereby through Kark's dilemma. I have argued elsewhere that we do, in fact, preserve the right explanatory relationships if we think of collective intentions as a kind of equilibrium state among the beliefs and desires of the individuals. So I personally am optimistic that the challenge can be met. But regardless of whether any particular theory is the right one, Kirk's arguments do not succeed in establishing the impossibility of constructing such a theory. They do, however, firmly place the burden of proof on the side of those, uh, those who, like me, believe that group-level concepts are both interesting and theoretically useful. And what is perhaps more valuable, his arguments highlight the important methodological questions concerning the relationship between individual and collective action theory. Thank you. Yeah, so there's a handout. Can you hear me like that? Does it work well? Unfortunately, it keeps uh, falling down. Any get uh, sure. gonna start? I've seen it before. So. There's a specter haunting the philosophy of collective intentionality, uh, the specter of group minds. And it doesn't only haunt Europe, uh, it ke even keeps up Kirk Ludwig in uh, Bloomington, Indiana, and uh, motivates him to write uh, a 300 plus pages book to give an analysis of plural action that avoids any reference not only to group minds, but also to any kind of group subjects or group agents. And I think the reason is, or it seems to me, that if uh, one of the reasons is that if we acknowledge group minds, there's the fear that if we acknowledge them, then we are uh, sorry. There's the fear that if we acknowledge group subjects, we might also have to acknowledge group minds. Now, Kirk would certainly agree with John Searle that this idea of a group mind or a group subject, even so, also rejects both is an abomination. But he also rejects Searle's attempt to find some sort of middle ground by saying there are no group subjects, but there's still a form of mind mode, or I call it mindedness also, that is a form of mind that is peculiar to collectivity, but there's no group subject. So that's like the mode account. Uh, it says there is this form of mindedness, but there is no group subject and there's no group, there's no content really associated with a we mode. Now, I think Kirk gives an excellent analysis of Searle's uh, position, but I just want to boil it down here to one point that he makes, which, uh, with, uh, with which I fully agree, that uh, he says, he asks what role can mold play if it's not reflected in content. I think the notion of content is really so central to understanding of intentionality, it's indeed hard to understand how mold can be relevant if it's not reflected in content. So this thought drives Kirk to embrace a content account, which so puts himself in the tradition of Michael Bradman. And so that uh, account says, we intentions are of the form. I intend that we J. And content is here understood to be what individuals intend. And the crucial claim is here also resources for understanding individual action are also sufficient for understanding collective 
action. Yeah, and so I mean by group mindedness anything that goes beyond these resources, and so the claim is that no appeal to group mindedness is required. Now, the main claims I want to make today is I want to argue that his reduction or elimination of group mindedness in order to account for collective action and attention, and the reduction to what content, to what individuals intend has implausible consequences and is subject to counterexamples. And uh, the criticism could be put in a nutshell by saying that jointness cannot be reduced to what content. It's not a matter of what individuals intend, but who intends it. And uh, therefore, I think it cannot work. But I also want to like at least sketch a more positive thesis. I agree very much uh, with Kirk that if we want to make sense of group mindedness, we must make sense of how it is reflected in content. And I think that also commits us to group subjects, but I don't think it commits us to group minds, but we can think of group subjects simply as, indiv of, as individuals as related to group mindedness. Yeah, so, but in order to do this, I think we have to move towards a traditional understanding of content, which identify content, identifies content with what people intend, believe, and so on, and acknowledge additional forms of content, which I call subject and position content. And, I th uh, and so I'm going to sketch an alternative, which I think can also meet uh, Kirk's, uh, I think, valid criticisms, again, of Margaret Gilbert's uh, form of a plural subject account. And towards the end, I'm going to say this can also account for distributive versus collective intending as opposed to acting and for intending to versus intending that. And so that uh, uh, alternative account looks somewhat like that. So the, the idea is before the we's were kind of isolated, there was just forms of group mindedness and now they're connected and we have a joint goal. Okay, so Kirk's position is uh, this, Rymo has already uh, said it, that a group G jointly intends if each group member is the subject of a we intention and we intentions are of the very simplified form. Now uh, Kirk's analysis is very extensive, but I want to focus just on one condition that he says, I intend that we J in accordance with a shared plan. I think one might try to criticize also the first point uh, because uh, one might think that in some cases maybe not all members of the group have to have the relevant attitude, but I won't. Uh, I will accept this for purposes of the argument. But I do not only want to question the second analysis. I also want to question its motivation uh, in a way. I mean, I want to ask why should we even strive for such a reduction of we to I? So, in my view, the we as the word is irreducible. Why should we even try to reduce it to I? Because it seems to me uh, we can have a view that accepts the irreducibility of the we, and that's still individualistic in, in as robust a sense as I think we could want. Yeah, so, so this would be one way of formulating this individualism about group intention. Whether group intends something depends entirely on the subject we intentions of its members or agents, if we have such cases as lawyer acting for corporations or something like that. So group intentions can only change through changes of these individual we intentions. So there's nothing there over and above individual minds, but still the we versus I may still be used to indicate irreducible differences in group mindedness or group identification. And I, I will argue that is in fact uh, how we use it. And so the idea is we pick out individuals as related in certain, related to certain forms of group mindedness. So that's uh, the background. Now I propose to take a step back and briefly look at Searle's analysis of causal self-referentiality because Kirk both accepts crucial aspects of this analysis and I think it's revealing to see his analysis as kind of like continuation and extension of the basic patterns of Searle's analysis. And I think he opens up uh, himself to similar objections then. So, so Searle proposed that the satisfaction of certain states and speech acts, including intention, require causal relation between themselves and the intended and ordered or perceived object. So 
So, uh, so the execution of intention requires causal relations between them and action. Therefore, the content is such that, so here we have the subject and the mode. I intend that I perform the action of raising my arm by way of carrying out this intention. So this is a self-referentiality. Now, here's just one problem with it. My intention to close the door, and you believe that I will, on this view, cannot have the same object. I think it seems to me it's natural to say it could have the same object. I intend to close the door. You believe that I will do this. And we're both directed at the same object, the action. But the causal relations between my state and my action are part of my intention, the content of my intention on this view, but not part of your belief. And therefore, it couldn't be said that we have this as the same identical object. And to put it even more simply, you could just say, really, this is, uh, is this, uh, this is wrong. The causal relation, yes, there is a causal requirement here, but it's not a matter, it's a matter of intending. It's a matter of me intending this and not of what I intend. And uh, Francois Recanati has uh, called this a fallacy of misplacing mode information, information that really belongs into the mode, into the content in the sense of what content. But of, in reasoning in this way, so proceeds from apparently plausible premises. The first is satisfaction intention must cause intended action. The second is that satisfaction condition must be determined by content. And the third is finally the, that content is what is intended or is the embedded proposition. And that leads us to the conclusion causal relation between intention and action must be represented as part of what content. Now many philosophers uh, would nowadays they would question the second uh, claim. But this is another point where I strongly agree uh, uh, with Kirk, he calls this a satisfaction principle, and it's a key principle for his uh, for his whole account. And I agree with that. But uh, where we disagree is the third uh, point, namely, uh, which embodies the traditional model of propositional attitudes and the force or mode content distinction. So, on the received view, subject and mode do not contribute to intentional content; only the proposition does. On the alternative view. Uh, I, the subject is never just aware of a state of affairs, but has at least a sense of itself and of its position vis-a-vis -vis the state of affairs. And so we have, in addition to object content uh, that represents the state of affairs, the relevant factor goal, we have subject content, which represents the subject, and position content, which represents the subject's position. So from this point of view, Searle's mistake is that he mislocates position content as object content. The alternative view says position contents represents the intention position. So I have at least a sense of this as something that, uh, that I'm about to do. I'm poised to cause this action. And that's why uh, my state has to cause this action in order to be uh, satisfied. So we can uh, fulfill the satisfaction uh, principle while simultaneously respecting the fact that intention and, uh, and beliefs can have identical objects. Now, uh, Kirk accepts Searle's analysis and extends it by including a guiding shared plan into object content. And I will argue that this exposes him to similar objections as Searle, as I've raised against Searle, and that mis it misconstrues plans and also at least implicitly subjects as parts of object content. And I want to argue the weakness of intentions is a matter of, again, uh, whose attention is and cannot be reduced to what is intended. So plans and the identity of intentions. So if acting in accordance with a shared plan is part of the content of we intention, I think this has counterintuitive consequences for the identity conditions of plans. Suppose that group A and group B want to host ENSO 6 in Paris. Yeah, but they have different plans, then I think on Kurt's account, they will also have different <coughs> intentions. Yeah, because uh, the, if the content of the intention is different, it's a different intention. Uh, or they might change plans. So that's the same point, uh, kind of like uh, on the temporal uh, uh, axis. Uh, so here, uh, just because we've changed our plans, uh, we've changed our attention. And that seems to me is unnatural. And I think it's even, it seems to me it even follows that because A and B intend the plan to be shared among different group members, A, the, group, the members of A intended to be shared among themselves, and the members of B intended to be shared among themselves, even if they have the same plan, just the mere fact that they have 
different members would lead us to say that it's a different intention. And so I think that's a counterintuitive uh, consequences. And just very briefly, I think the uh, alternative would be to say some intentions may essentially be part of plans, but I don't think we should say that the plans are part of their content. Okay, so now uh, why the shared plans? So uh, Kirk introduces shared plans to block a counterexample to what he introduces as his in initial analysis, which only appealed to individual plans. So uh, the first is, uh, case is a variation of an example of Michael Bradman's involves mutual deceptions. So suppose that two agents, they're painting houses as always with uh, Bradman. And so they trick each other into using Sherwin Williams paint for their joint painting job by surreptitiously filling up the other's can with it because they falsely believe that the other a painter prefers a different paint. And so they mutually trick themselves into using the Sherman Williams paint. Each individual plan succeed. They jointly paint the house uh, with Sherman Williams paint and they intentionally paint the house together, but they do not intentionally uh, paint the house together with Sherman uh, Williams. So the account cannot explain joint intentional action of this uh, kind. And the, the example for the second kind of case that I want to focus on uh, varies John Searle's example of Smith and Jones making a sauce hollandaise <laughs> together. Rather improbably, but not impossibly, Kirk imagines that Smith might just want to exercise his wrist by stirring, while Jones just wants to practice his technique for putting ingredients in a pan with a minimum physical movement preparing for a Zen cooking competition. Yeah, so each draws up his exercise plan ahead of time and leaves it on the kitchen table and each notices the other's plans and decides to take advantage of it in order to create a sauce hollandaise. Uh, so things go as planned, so they end up creating a sauce hollandaise together. But again, they did not do it intentionally as a, as a, as a group. They just exploited each other's culinary exercises, treating them as worldly preconditions of their individual actions, just as they made use of the ingredients in the kitchen, or as one uses water, sunlight, and so on. Furthermore, I think Kirk also rightly emphasizes that the popular move of appealing to a condition of knowledge or awareness of their common knowledge or awareness of their respective intentions does not fix the problem. So even if they all know this, uh, Smith and Jones may still persist in taking advantage of each other's plan in this way without adopting a joint plan or intention. Maybe Kirk imagines because they have a head of spat, yeah, and so they just do it anyway, but they, they don't agree to do it, so they don't jointly attend it. Okay, so now Kirk brings in the shared plans to fix this problem and says if they had intended to act in accordance with the shared plan, that would fix the problem. But what does it mean here to share a plan? So here he says, quote, it comes to their all intending that there's a plan each of them has when acting and that they participate in the action in accordance with the plan. So each group members intends that there be one identical plan they all act in accordance with. Now it's important to emphasize that I intend that we J in accordance with the shared plan here cannot mean something like I intend that we intend, so it cannot be an intention that we form a joint intention, nor can shared plan mean our plan or something like the plan we have on pain of circularity. Yeah, because that would uh, mean we introduce these notions uh, like of a joint plan that we want to analyze, or joint attention that we want to analyze. That the plan is shared just means that each individual intends that the same plan be followed. But now I think the problem is having the same goal of the same plan being followed by the same people and jointly having a plan is not the same as jointly having a plan and I think cannot explain the jointness of intention. So here is a, a counterexample and it basically just says we uh, exchange the individual plans in the early examples by a plan for joint action. And so Smith creates a plan for him and Jones making Hollandaise, specifying their roles, a time and place, puts it in the kitchen for Jones, Jones copies it and puts it in Smith's room so Smith has, inten I intend that we, that is Jones and I make Hollandaise in accordance with plan B and accordingly Jones 
he has the intention, I intend that we, Smith and I make, and so on. So they mutually intend that they participate in a joint action in accordance with the same plan. But I think still, they do not jointly intend to make Holland theirs. It would not be accurate for either of them to say, we intend to make Holland theirs together in accordance with our joint plan P. Why? Because they have not jointly committed to this course of action. There has been no meeting of minds. They have not connected with regard to this course of action, however you want to put it. And again, it's, I think that mutual awareness would not change this either. Yeah? So it, that's theoretical awareness of the other's intentions falls short of a joint practical commitment. So even mutually expressing the I intentions would not be sufficient. Each must affirm something like, let's make the source together according to P. So each must represent the subject of this intentions through the subject content of an irreducible we, which puts them out as jointly committed to action. So that, that gives us a collective, non-distributive reading of we intention. I come to that. So I have three more slides. Can I do them? Yeah, thanks. So first, I want to briefly comment. Uh, so does that mean I'm endorsing Margaret Gilbert's account of plural subjects because I just appeal to commitments? I, ex I agree with Kirk's criticism of it when he says he uses the example of some guy is kicking around a ball in a park and two other people join and say, if C kicks the ball to B and then waves and runs back to the sidewalk, we have no sense that A and B have a right to call him back to participate. And I think that is completely right, but there's still a bond here as evidenced by that he describes uh, it uh, quite naturally. One is waving, and that is an example of what uh, Michael Tomazello and other psychologists call leaf taking a behavior that starts about around three years of age. And I think it, it evidences there is some kind of bond, some kind of connection. It would be rude just to run away. So there are non -con uh, conceptual, non propositional forms of group creating, group mindedness, such as in joint attention, joint action, joint skills, joint patterns, tendency, and so on. So commitment is important, but I think it's not necessary. Okay, one way of putting my point is to say um, there is a collective reading also of intending and not only of the action that is intending. Now, Raimo reminded us already uh, that K Kirk's account of distributive versus collective action reading is for each X of S, there's an e event of X singing. That's just the distributive reading versus there's an event of singing such that each X of us participates in it. Now, he says now there is no collective reading for attention, though it is formally available, because he says one and the same state cannot be a state of distinct objects. But if that's a good argument, I want to ask, why isn't one and the same action cannot be an action of distinct objects or subjects, um, if you will? Uh, so you see that's a rhetorical uh, question, obviously. Uh, I think an exactly parallel argument can be drawn up, and my hunch would be we should reject both of these arguments, but Kirk's procedure is in keeping with the tradition of treating collective action as less problematic than collective intention. And my worry again is this some kind of dualism, the specter of the group mind. So and it seems to me there's really no reason for this different treatment. There's no more reason to suppose that collective intention requires a group mind than that collective action requires a group body. So we can just think of collective actions as connected individual actions that gives us joint actions, collective intentions we have connected individual states and that gives us joint intentions and individuals connected to actions, intentions, attention, skills and so are group subjects and then we can avoid any mismatch between intention and action subject of the form I intend that we J. Now this point has to be made with some care I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with, for example, having something like I intend that we J or I or we intend that somebody organize endo six or anything of that kind. But I think that we intend that somebody organize endo six, for example, which is not our action, only makes sense if we are ready to intend to do things to bring this about. Yeah, so we can only have this our aim if we can do things and intend things to bring uh, this about so I or we intend that is both different from and presupposes I 
or we intend to. And so we need to account for both and we need to account for the difference. Yeah? And Kirk gives an account of the difference for the individual case, but not for the weak case. And I don't think how he could uh, possibly do it because that requires the matching of the subjects of intention and action. So thank you very much. Okay, this is a good part. Don't leave now. Okay, there we go. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank Rimo and Sarah and Michael uh, for reading my book so carefully, participating in the symposium, and trying so hard to identify the fatal flaws in the project which would destroy the whole enterprise. I really appreciate their doing that. But I am a, I'm a kind of hard case, and they are going to be disappointed in how much <laughs> progress I have made under their instruction. Okay, so. Um, I want to say just a little bit in review of some of the main themes in the book, just to sort of fix ideas, and then I'm going to take, start with uh, Rymo's comments and then Sarah's, and finally finish with Michael's. Okay, so uh, I want to say, let's see, is this thing working? <laughs> oh, yes, it is. Okay, so I want to say something. Hey, yeah. Uh, uh, there's like joint presentation here, two slides at the same time. So I want to say something just about the methodology of the book. And um, uh, right, so um, the idea was to try to get some additional leverage in thinking about what's going on with uh, particularly plural action sentences. So I have a second book that works on institutional uh, action as well. And uh, the idea was to make use of a really rich body of work on the logical form of singular action sentences and see if we could use that as leverage to get a better handle on what's going on with plural action sentences. And there has been some work on the logical form of plural action sentences more in linguistics than in philosophy, but in collective action theory, there was nothing. Nobody was thinking about this whatsoever. And so it seemed to me initially, in a way you can blame Rimo for this because he came and gave us a talk at the University of Florida in 2003, and I was giving a seminar on the philosophy of action then, and we read the paper he sent us, which was We Intentions Revisited, published in 2005 in Phil Studies. And the thought struck me that you know people weren't thinking about this then. And uh, it seemed to me that you could actually uh, clarify the questions and maybe make some progress on answering some of them, and then use that as a springboard for investigating more generally the nature of social, social reality. So the idea was you know, leverage all this work on logical form, get clearer about what's going on with logical form of singular action sentence. And I do some work on that in the book and then see how you can project it, project it to the case of plural action sentences and use all of this, the constraints that come with trying to give a systematic compositional story about the language used to talk about plural action. And then once you've got that in hand, take that and apply it to the case of uh, plural attributions of intentions using work on attributions of I intentions, individ individual intentions and their contents. So it's take all the stuff in the individual case Think of how it projects, first of all, the plural action sentences, and then think about how that gets worked into the content of plural attributions of intentions. So this is the idea. Um, I'll come back to you know, whether or not uh, worries about group minds plays a big role in my motivations. But first, um, <laughs> just real quickly, uh, you know, if you really just want to boil down the, the book to what are the main uh, sort of thematic things, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. But I would say, first of all, there's the multiple agents account of collective action. 
that's the thing that Ryan will describe at the outset. Uh, plural action centers are ambiguous between a distributive and a collective reading of I say we built a boat. And it's, you know, an engineering class. We all had a project, and we all decided we'd build a boat. By coincidence, we discovered that somebody else, what did you do? And I say, we built a boat. Distributive reading. Each of us is such that he built a boat. Or each of us is such there's some event of which he is an agent, and it's a boat, boat building. And then there's the plural case. That there's a collective reading of that as well. We built a boat where we mean not that each of us did so individually, but we did it together. But once you've got the idea that the, you know, the matrix of that action sentence introduces a a quantifier over an event, and in the distributed case, the noun phrase is interpreted as a quantifier over members of the group, just reverse the order of the quantifiers, and you get an intuitive account of what's going on in the collective action case. If, in fact, there's some event, for example, in a case of lifting a bench, a bench going up, that each of us contributes to, and no one else in the relevant way, then a bench was lifted by us. We lifted a bench together. And you get this just drops out of thinking about the logical form. Okay, so that's the first step. And then, uh, once we've got this idea that plural action sentences don't actually introduce a group into the agency relation, but only individuals, when you go to think about plural attributions of intentions, there's no point in having a group as the subject of the intention. So you just, uh, you, you interpret the noun phrase distributively, both when you get the distributed reading of the attribution of uh, intentions to group and in the collective case. And then it's all a matter of what's going on with the rest of it. So each of us, well, to use Rymo's phrase, we intends us to do something. And the question is uh, how to interpret what's going on with that uh, last part. And as Michael says, I have a content-based approach like Bratman, and it's motivated fundamentally by trying to think through a compositional account of the verb intention, the uh, grammatical object of that, what's going on with uh, individual and plural action sentences. So that's where the basic motivation comes from. Okay, so now I'm going to just run, th oh, and well, finally, uh, with respect to we intentions, yeah, the central idea is what I'm calling the shared plan analysis. And um, that too is actually motivated by systematic projection of what we would say about individual intentions of the plural case. So it's not primarily case motivated. It's primarily motivated by an analysis of the semantic and logical structure of attributions of individual and plural intentions together with an account of the logical form of plural action sentences. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about uh, Rymo's uh, remarks and um, well, so here's, here's the first uh, sort of uh, semi-disagreement, I think. I'm not quite sure there's a real disagreement with us here. Uh, so Rymo says, I agree with Ludwig's multiple agents account in principle, but argue that in the case of a group jointly singing the national anthem, the group plural subject group is or can be the agent of anthem singing and he says an approximate functional sense of acting as if it were a proper agent. So I want to say uh, well uh, okay in some sense yes an approximate functional sense of acting as if it were one agent who could object to it put that way. I, yeah there's come some kind of analogies between you know two people getting together and you know taking a walk and a single person taking a walk. Um, I don't think when we sing the national anthem together we're actually trying or intending to act as if we were one big guy with a huge voice who could sing multiple harmonies at the same time. But, you know, there's a sense in which it's like, you know, somebody has a really loud voice who's really big. Okay, so that's okay. Um, you know, sometimes we actually do get together and, you know, act so as to emulate something else. There is a, there's a dragon dance, right? Uh, and, you know, there's the two-man horse. <laughs> right? I saw it. That's fine. But I just want to say, don't mistake it for the real thing. And don't think that by calling it a horse, you get a better explanation saying there are two guys in there who are emulating a horse. Okay. <laughs> so I'm not sure there's a difference here. Uh, you'd have to get more precise about what the approximate functional sense is uh, to see what it really comes to. Okay. So uh, Rymo asks, is my account ontologically reductive or not? Um, well, let's see. I think I think you covered that. It was in the written comments. And uh, just very gr briefly to clarify, so I do admit groups into my ontology in addition to individuals. So I don't get rid of groups. I don't attempt to do reduce the we to an I either. There's the we. It picks out a group of individuals, including the person, uses the term. No problem about that. Uh, what I do say is that they don't enter into the agency relation. 
So that's where that distributive quantifier comes from. So there's some event such that each of us is an agent of it. So the only thing that enters into the agency relation are individuals. But the us appears in that distributive quantifier, so I'm not getting rid of groups. They're part of my ontology. So groups, but no group agents. That's my slogan. Okay. Okay. So I'm also asked, uh, can a count of, log of the logical form of you know, sentences about uh, collective action, uh, institutional action, and so on, uh, settle ontological issues like whether they're group agents? Well, um, well, not exactly. What it really settles is what are the ontological requirements of the discourse that we engage in about group agents. And if we think what we say is true, as I think we do, then these things can be true without there being group agents. Is there a further question about whether or not there are genuine group agents out there, independently of whether or not the claims we make about social reality are true or not? Well, yes, of course there is. Uh, but you know, to settle a question like that, you have to do some more work. If you agree with me about logical form, but you think they're genuine group agents, then first of all, you have to have a theory of mind really art, well articulated theory of mind that says what is the supervenience base for having a genuine agent and then you need to go out in the world and you need to show that some group of agents actually satisfies those conditions but is that what people do it's not what people do now you could be a functionalist you could be emergent on any of these views in principle it's possible for there to be group agents but nobody has actually articulated an adequate functional theory of the mind, so of course they haven't gone out in the world and shown that some group satisfies the description. Moreover, if that's your way of looking at it, there's no in principle reason why you would expect that the things we say using group action sentences should correspond to whatever mental states are going on in the group on the functional basis. They could be completely independent. Okay. So it seems to me that's really a kind of red herring with respect to the sorts of things that the people in this room are interested in which is what's going on in the world that corresponds to the, the, the descriptions of so social reality that we use in ordinary life. Okay. So I think it's the wrong place to look for the kind of ontological, uh, the ontology of the social that we're interested in. Okay, so, um, well, uh, yeah, what about those criticisms of folk psychology and reliance on intuitions? I got a lot to say about this, but I don't think I want to say it here. I'm just going to say, uh, this isn't a problem, especially for my account. It's a problem for the account a lot of people give of what's going on in collective action. It's a, you know, a problem for a lot of traditional philosophy in general, or it would be if it were sound. Okay. <laughs> so I don't think I have to do you know, a, a job here in responding to this on behalf of the kind of my, my book, but we could all get together and you know, have a joint response to these people who say what you're doing doesn't make any sense. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Okay, so let's see. Um, the final thing I want to talk about. I'm not going to be able to touch on everything that uh, my commentators had, have said, so I'm just going to try to pick out things that I think might be, might be of interest to see how I respond uh, to them. So Rimmel says, Ludwig's account is okay so far as it goes. <laughs> but my own account, in contrast to Ludwig's mm -hmm. content-based account, uses thick we mode, we intentions. And it does not agree with Ludwig's thesis that we intentions be analyzed solely on the basis of concepts which are already in play in understanding individual intentional action. And here's the thing that's really important. Moreover, he claims, the thick notion explains more than the thin notions. And so while there can be no objection to there being thin we intentions, we need thick we intentions for full understanding of social reality. So I think that's the, that's the big claim. Okay. Now, uh, Rimo doesn't actually give the arguments in his comment. What he does is he points to other things he's written, like the 2013 book. And um, we have an exchange, actually, on this in a, a recent collection that's just come out. Um, do you remember the, the title of that? Rimo had it on his slide. Oh, okay. And so you pr you've seen the title, at least. <laughs> I can't repeat it. So, um, so there's an exchange in that between us, and uh, there I argue that he doesn't succeed in showing that you need the thick we notions in order to accommodate the sort of data that he says. Uh, so, you know, if I went into that, this would be a symposium on Rimo's book rather than mine, so I'm not going to do that really. But let me just give you a, a brief feel for the kinds of uh, things at issue. So, uh, this is the high-low game. Uh, here's a, there's, um, you know, 
sort of two choices people can, two individuals can make. And if they both make a certain choice, they end up with something that is good for both of them. And if they make another choice together, they end up with something that's good for both of them, but not as good. And if they don't coordinate, then they're in trouble. So suppose I make a, an agreement with a colleague to eat lunch uh, together today, but we don't specify where. And then when we, we are apart, we suddenly realize we didn't settle that. Then we have to decide where to go. And there are two restaurants we usually go to for lunch, right? So which one should I go to? And I realize there's one that today is going to be closer to both of us than the other one. So that's going to be a high-low game. If we arrive at a restaurant together, that's good. If we arrive at the closer one, that's better because we each have to travel less distance. Okay, and traditional game theory has trouble with this because there are two equilibrium in this, and they can't, you can't distinguish between it in classical game theory. Okay, so uh, you know, here's the basic question. So team reasoning is supposed to be a way around this by you know, thinking of the agent's uh, orientation being toward the group good rather than individual good, and that's supposed to change the structure of the reasoning. Uh, and Rimel suggested that, you know, you could get this kind of correspondence between the thick Wii mode and team reasoning. So far as I can tell, uh, team reasoning is perfectly compatible with my view of Wii intentions. And uh, if you just ask yourself commonsensically, how do people solve problems like this? Well, you know, um, one, one op option is obviously the thing that's going to make sense to uh, each of us as being the best option. And we think the other guy is going to do the sensible thing. Um, so we just do it, right? One option is clearly better, but you don't need any, you know, sui generis we we mode notions to explain what's going on here. Okay, so I claim this is so for all the cases like this. You, you go and look at these collective action problems. I claim you do not need sui generis concepts to explain why people actually choose what we think is a sensible option. Okay, so that's where the argument rests, and I obviously haven't worked through it all, uh, but. Um, you can go and look at this exchange and see which of us you think is right about this. Okay. Um, now, let me go on. Oh, so <clears throat> to sum up, as Laplace said about God's existence, I have no need of this hypothesis, the thick Wiimote uh, thing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, on, on to Sarah's uh, comments. So, um, does collective action require a collective intention. And Sarah actually agrees with me that the answer is no, but she thinks I'm a little too generous about you know, what could count as an action without there being a collective intention. So I do want to clarify a little bit how I'm thinking about this. There is a real danger, I think, that uh, in a dispute about whether collective action requires a, a collective intention, it can devolve into a verbal dispute. So it's perfectly fine with me if someone says, look, you know, collective action for me, just is a whole bunch of people bringing about some event when they jointly intend to bring it about. I say, well, if you want to use the word collective action to mean what I mean by collective intentional action, that's okay. Right? You could mean that by the word collective action. Okay. So is there a real dispute? Well, there might be a real dispute when we move from, you know, this the word collective action actually isn't very common in ordinary speech. Okay. When we move from just you know talk about the use of the word collective action to thinking about uh, collective action sentences. So what I want to claim is that there are a lot of collective action sentences that are true, though there's no description under which a group did anything intentionally. So when I say you know when I think about collective action, even when I think about individual action, you say what did someone do? That's really a request for an action sentence. And if you say what did they do? That's really a quest for an action sentence. The what gets replaced by a verb phrase with an action verb in it. Okay, so my claim is that in this way of thinking about it, there are collective actions whenever there are true collective action sentences, and that's in fact the way Sarah put it. So we are poisoning the environment. It's an action sentence, and it's true, right? And it's a collective action sentence, but there's no description under which we're doing this together intentionally. The crowd waiting for the train is making a lot of noise. Now, this is true of many crowds in many train stations. Uh, is there, need there be any description under which all those people are doing anything together intentionally? No. Okay. The driver is rubbernecking at the accident cause of traffic jam. This is, uh, this is a sort of phrase in American English. Is that I know what that means? You're driving down the road, there's an accident, and you go, that's rubbernecking. <laughs> you slow down when you do it, 
and then everybody behind you slows down, and the result is a traffic jam. Okay, but there need not be anything, any description under which the people are causing a traffic jam are doing something intentionally together. Okay, and this just falls out of my basic analysis of collective action sentences, and so I just rest the whole story on having the correct analysis of the logical form of collective action sentences, and this, you know, observation that when we talk about action, really just it's proxy for talking about true action sentences. Okay, now there might be more to say about, in, inten, you know, these intuitions about individual cases, but um, I'm going to leave it at that and move on to the next thing. Okay, so, uh, yeah, well, Sarah, Sarah did take back the really strong things she did and said in the written comments. That there's nobody who thinks that their, you know, groups really have cognitive states just like individuals. I think there are actually a lot of people. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah. Well, you can track him down. <laughs> <laughs> I took so, it back when I saw Christian yeah, here. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, well, you know, tilting at windmills, uh, no, no. I said no, I said no. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. You took I it back here. I prepared the slides ahead of time. No, it was a question. Would people okay. think that? Okay. Okay, so what about the middle ground? This is the real issue. Um, is there a middle ground between the inflationary group mind picture and the individualistic nothing else there position? And Sarah says, Ludwig rejects the idea there are useful explanatory categories identified by group level concepts. So um, I want to say I really don't hold anything that strong. I never say anything that just, you know, blanket rejection of group level concepts being useful for theoretical purposes. And I don't hold it and I don't believe it, but <coughs> I think Sarah is right, and I am very skeptical that there are group level attributions using psychological terms that do useful theoretical work. But that's a much narrower claim. Uh, it's also a little bit tentative. Um, I think we do make psychological attributions uh, to groups, particularly in the organizational setting, in a kind of analogical sense. Um, but as Sarah suggests, I don't think they're really precise rules of application and that these really have the character of kinds of a metaphor that conveys something about what we might call the action potential of organizations. But if you really want to make precise predictions, you have to go below the level of those attributions and look at organizational structure and policies and who plays uh, various roles in executing policy the company has and so on. And so you have to descend below that level of attribution to the group to get anything like a precise prediction of this behavior. And so it looks like the right explanatory level is going to be below the level of these group level attributions of psychological states. Okay, so, um, well, does that mean there aren't other kinds of interesting group level concepts that might do real theoretical work? No, I think there are. But then we need to construct them and see what kind of work they do and how they're related to our ordinary ways of talking about groups. Okay. So, I think that makes, puts Sarah me closer together than she thought we were, but maybe we're still not quite uh, sitting right next to each other. Okay, on to Michael. <clears throat> fear of groups mind, group minds. I have to say, you know, fear of group minds has never cut, kept me up at night or, you know, caused me to wake up in anxiety in the middle of the night. I just don't take it seriously enough to be worried about it. What keeps me up in Bloomington usually is having drunk too much wine with dinner. So, um, yeah, no, that's not it. It's the thing that I said initially. I, mean, I want to get clear about what's going on when we talk about collective action uh, and, you know, joint intention and when we get to the institutional stuff as well. Uh, and I was looking for leverage, a way of getting into this in a way that gave us more constraints on an adequate theory so we could bring to bear more evidence. And I'm just trying to get clear about these things. And it's an upshot of this that groups don't appear in the agency relation and an account of the truth conditions of group action sentences. Okay, and the rest just sort of follows out of that. Okay. Uh, there are independent reasons, of course, to be suspicious of the group mind hypothesis, and you know, I do say some of that, but the basic motivation of the project is independent of that. Okay, so now on to there are two things, other things I want to talk about. The rejection and satisfaction principle and the uh, putative counterexample, which I know you're all waiting to hear about. Um, has to be said, you know, coming up with a counterexample to the one true theory is hard <laughs> because you cannot counterexample reality. Okay, so we're, we're going to have to look at that. 
Okay, so, <clears throat> yeah, here's an, an argument that uh, Michael presents, and he, which he attributes to me. Okay. To Searle. Ah, yes, well, I thought you were saying <clears throat> I had to buy into it as well. If not, then, then, oh, I could just skip this part. And, you know, this criticism was of Searle, not of me. So I'm home free. I don't have to accept that mode business, right? No, I mean, I would certainly like to know what you think about okay. it. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Okay. You ex yeah. Well, one thing I'd like to point out, uh, the first thing, is that uh, the conclusion follows, except for the last comma bit, without the third premise. So, sure, I accept one and two, and I accept the conclusion, except for the thing after the comma. <laughs> Job done. Okay. Now, actually, in your slide, as opposed to the written thing, you have an extra equivalence on the end, and this is where I, you know, there's going to be something important to say. Uh, and that is content of intention <coughs> equals propositional content equals what is intended. Now, I actually do hold that the, the content of the intention is its propositional content in this traditional sort of mode content picture of how things work. But what I don't agree with is that the phrase what is intended always picks out propositional content. And since uh, Michael's arguments hinge upon intuitions about what is intended or the object of intention, it turns out to be misleading. It's not a sound argument. Okay, not a valid argument. Okay, well, uh, let's, uh, let's look at uh, this. Oh, there's, there's that. So. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so here's something that Michael says. If I intend to close the door and you believe that I will, it seems natural to say that what I intend is also what you believe. That's the thing I want to focus on. He also goes on to say, um, we are directed at the same object in the world. My action, which is a goal for me, and a fact, an object of belief for you. Now, hmm. actually, I can intend to do something without ever doing it, so the action can't be the object of the intention. So something <coughs> has to be fixed there. Um, so um, anyway, I'm going to focus on the what I intend business, because it seems to me that's really what's driving it. OK, so uh, is it really true uh, that uh, you know, if I intend to open the door, uh, and you believe that I will open the door, you believe what I intend? No. OK, so here's an argument. <coughs> I intend to drown my sorrows in a barrel of beer. So, well, what is it I intend? What I intend is to drown my sorrows in a barrel of beer. You believe what I intend, so you believe to drown my sorrows in a barrel of beer. That's not even grammatical. Okay, you may think, oh, man, come on. Come on. I believe that you will do this. <laughs> okay, so, um, well, you know, one thing, um, that's important to sort of uh, think about is, you know, what is the function of talk about what someone believes or desires or wants and so on? Uh, and uh, I think it turns out that the what often picks out a grammatical object, which is not the whole of what we would even standardly think of as the propositional content. So that's really the trouble with these kinds of arguments. And this is a kind of play on that, because uh, the what here in premise two is picking up <coughs> just the infantile phrase. And in fact, very often when I say so-and-so believes or desires or wants, what so-and-so does is just picking up the infantival phrase. Okay, so I'll give you some examples. So I do agree. So um, this is something that, that Michael uh, accepts and that I agree with. You cannot infer sameness with content from it being okay to say that X thinks wants, et cetera, what Y does. So that's what I agree with. But what I don't agree with that is that the what Y does picks out propositional content. Okay, so that's really where the disagreement comes from. So uh, <clears throat> Trump always thinks that he is the smartest man in the room. Okay, That's what Bannon always thinks, too. That's why they were never going to get along in, long, long, in the long term. Okay. Now, of course, when I say that's what Bannon always thinks, too, I mean that Bannon thinks it, always thinks that he is the smartest person in the room. But this is perfectly ordinary English. The what can shift. You know, what's really going on here is that we're picking out uh, a sentence in which the subject term co-refers with the um, subject of the complement clause. So that's what's being transferred with the what, but it's not propositional content. Okay. 
So Trump wants to be the smartest man in the room. And he fears he never is. And that explains a lot about him, actually. <laughs> well, Bannon wants the same thing Trump does. And that's why he's an angry white man as well. OK? And uh, Bannon wants what Trump wants, too. Okay. Here the what is just picking up the infinitival phrase, right? To be the smartest man in the room. So it's not a reliable test of propositional content. Okay. Now, um, there's another argument. Uh, yeah, this I think Michael did give this. Um, so there's some other things uh, that rely on the, the what locution. And so I'm not going to pick those out specifically. But I want to pick out some things that are unconnected with that. One of them is this. In addition to the counterintuitive consequences mentioned already, when I change the plan for executing an intention, I also change that intention itself, which seems wrong. OK, does it? Well, suppose I you know, uh, form the intention to drive to Georgia, and I haven't done any planning yet, but then I do some planning. Now I intend to drive to Georgia by renting a car from Hertz, taking Route 46 to Columbus, then I-65 to Nashville, then I-24 to Chattanooga, and then I-75 to Atlanta. OK, well. You know, if you ask me what do you intend to do, then I'll give you this thing with the by locution in it, which indicates that I've actually done some planning, and that informs now what I intend to do. Has my intention changed? Well, I don't care whether you say it's changed or it's the same, but this is a perfectly ordinary thing. There's nothing funny about it. It doesn't seem just wrong. Okay. So this, this happens whenever you, you know, form an initial intention directed at doing something, but it's going to require further planning to get it done. And when the further planning occurs, we read that back into the content of the intention, but it wasn't there to begin with. Okay, so that's okay. Nothing wrong there. Okay, now the thing you've all been waiting for is the counter example. Imagine that the Hollandaise, in the Hollandaise sauce scenario, jo Smith and Jones know of each other and that they are open to suggestions. So Smith writes out a plan for the making Hollandaise, which specifies a time and place and what part each should play, and leaves it in the kitchen with the intention of getting Jones to make a holiday sauce with him in accordance with his plan. So Jones likes the plan and in turn leaves a copy of it in Smith's mailbox with the intention of getting Smith to make a holiday sauce with him in accordance with it. And, and Michael says that then when they do it, they don't do it together intentionally. And well, we should ask, what's supposed to have gone wrong? And it seems to me that the thing that Michael has in mind is that each has a kind of picture. I mean, you just look at the description of the case and why is that case supposed to raise a problem? It seems that each has a picture of how the other got involved, but each has a picture that can't be right if the one the other has is right. Okay, so I agree, something kind of went wrong there, but does it undermine the claim that they acted together intentionally? And I want to say, no, it doesn't. And uh, to convince you of this, I'm going to shift from this case to other cases, since you know, might think this is a bone of contention here. But these other cases, you'll see I'm going to do, go to three cases, which are going to get closer and closer than this one. You can see, you know, look, there's no question in these other cases that the parties acted together intentionally. Okay, so that's the strategy. Okay, case one. Um, I'm at a party, and I want to play matchmaker between Bud and Pearl. I know they're both into the rumba, and so I get. So what I do is I go to Bud and I say, Pearl wants to dance the rumba with you the next time Besame Mucho is on the stereo. And then I go to Pearl and I say the same thing. Well, not exactly the same thing, but that's the way we talk, right? Okay, you, you get it. Then I put Besame Mucho on the stereo and Bud and Pearl dance the rumba, each intending they dance the rumba when Besame Mucho is on the stereo. So did they dance the rumba together intentionally? Well, obviously so. I mean, there's no question in this case. It would be absurd to deny it. But they certainly had the wrong idea about why the other arrived on the dance floor at the right time. Each thought that the other had asked him or her to dance, and in fact, neither had. But it doesn't make a difference. Okay. Is it really a, a rumba plan, you might wonder? Is it like mixing the holiday sauce? Well, they've both been to dance school recently, so in fact, they know the rumba plan. This is plan rumba. It's a box step. Okay. How many people dance the rumba? Never mind. OK, so that's the, that's the rumba plan. OK, case two. We're going to get closer and closer to the Smith and Jones case. Bud and Pearl each want to dance the rumba with the other, and each determines to send the other note suggesting it, knowing that the other is suggestible. 
They are a bit shy, so they ask me to deliver the notes, but I'm lazy. And I see that even if I don't deliver the notes, they'll get together because they'll each think that the note got delivered. And so I just let nature take its course. They get together, dance the rumba the next time. Besame Mucho is on the stereo. Did they dance the rumba unintentionally? No. But they each arrived at the dance thinking that the other was responding to his or her invitation. And each was mistaken. OK. OK, third case. Bud leaves a note on Pearl's chair that says, let's dance the rumba the next time Besame Mucho is on the stereo. Maybe on the back there's a little rumba plan, right? So it actually specifies the steps. And, OK. So he thinks that Pearl will realize he's the one who left it, for whatever reason. Um, but Pearl doesn't connect it with Bud. She sees it. But the thought occurs to her that she can leave the note for Bud, thinking he will know she left it, and that they can then dance the rumba. So she leaves it on his chair, but he never sees it. And they get together on the dance floor, and they dance a rumba, each intending they dance a rumba in accordance with a common plan. Do they dance the rumba unintentionally? Well, no. But this is just the Smith and Jones case, as described by Michael. Now, Michael didn't say this, but you know, in his written comments, uh, his, his, uh, his summing up of this uh, was that, well, um, How did you put this exactly? Um, yes, it was something like the reductive account remains elusive despite Kirk's valiant efforts to deliver one. Okay, so I want to say uh, the counterexample to my account remains elusive despite Michael's valiant efforts <laughs> to find one. Okay, and so I'm going to leave it there with Bud and Pearl <laughs> dancing the rock. Thank you. <laughs> We have around 18 minutes for discussion, and I think we'll let uh, Kirk have the last word among the panelists and leave the, open the floor for discussion. Yeah, so I thought I'd uh, make some remarks in support of uh, group agents and group minds sure. uh, against uh, some of the skepticism. So I think, for the sake of argument, um, one can entirely grant your analysis of plural action sentences and say that this is the correct analysis for plural action sentences that you offer. And one can then still um, accept um, the point that a number of group action sentences um, are actually of the singular rather than plural kind. So when people uh, speak about um, you know what the police does, yeah, or what yeah, the state good. does, or what British Petroleum yeah, does, right. or thinks, or believes, mm -hmm. or desires. Yeah. Those are singular action sentences, and so on the face of it, um, our folk understanding of these singular action sentences does seem to um, attribute, um, you know, certain kinds of psychological states like beliefs and desires to the relevant corporate um, entities. So that's that's one point I, I wanted to make. And then two other quick points um, are, are the following. So um, you suggest that groups do not feature in the agency relation. Again, I think that may very well be right when we look at the plural action sentences that, that you analyze. But on the other hand, if we take the um, example of these singular action sentences mm -hmm. involving uh, corporate entities, then um, arguably those corporate entities do feature in the agency relation on a sort of perfectly natural mm -hmm. understanding. And then finally, I mean, is there an explanatory use for attributions of psychological states to, to groups? Well, I would argue that we, we have some um, uh, cases of, um, you know, fairly widely accepted explanatory use for this sort of thing. For instance, in the theory of the firm in economics, where we uh, use tools from game theory, let's say, to make sense of how firms behave competitively mm -hmm. on the marketplace, where we ascribe um, beliefs and desires to those firms in the form of utilities and subjective probabilities, and then um, are, are able to uh, give 
perfectly and perfectly adequate uh, accounts of how those firms would strategically interact. Now, of course, in this kind of case, you might say, well, maybe this attribution of beliefs and desires to those firms is just um, a, a useful metaphor, just some kind of theoretical construct. We shouldn't interpret it too literally. But on the other hand, that would be taking a substantive view in a philosophy of science debate. Namely, you would then be an instrumentalist about those kinds of scientific theories. And if we want to be scientific realists and how we understand those theories, then we might say, well, on the face of it, if those theories really are our best scientific theories of those collective phenomena, then we might as well take their ascription of beliefs and desires to groups at face value. Anyway, I just yeah. wanted to you know, okay, raise great. these various uh, yeah. uh, okay. points and, and you know, hear your response. Great. Okay. okay, so there is a second volume coming, it turns <laughs> out. And the second volume is about grammatically singular group action sentences, including action sentences about institutions, which use grammatically singular terms. And I give a long, long argument there for the, the for the conclusion that uh, the multiple agents account of um, plural action sentences can be extended and should be extended to the case of institutional action sentences. So you can get a lot of the same data going. Uh, for example, you can get collective and distributive ambiguity for institutional action sentences. Uh, when, it, when it's difficult to do that, it's usually, well, it's always because it turns out the verb itself uh, selects an event type that has to be brought about constitutively by more than one agent. But that's not about the structural form of the sentence. It's about something you add with the verb. And you get that even with plural action sentences. So you, you, it's, a hard, it's hard to get a collective reading of, we will meet in the library. Why? Because it doesn't make sense to say, I will meet in the library. right? Because it's a collective action event that is expressed. But that doesn't mean that the structure of the sentence isn't that each of us will contribute to bringing about that there's this event of our meeting in the library. OK, but now I'm not going to give you the whole argument here because um, it take a long time. And it's coming out. I want you to read the book. <laughs> uh, OK, so that actually uh, it addresses sort of the first two points because uh, I think the argument of that book uh, pushes back against both those, those things. Now, the third thing. Yeah, well, I should look in a little bit more to the way these notions are used in uh, economics. Um, no, I don't object to there being um, one designing concepts, even using the word belief and desire to express them, uh, to keep track of what I was calling the action potential of firms. I think in ordinary discourse, it's too loose, really, to do a lot of predictive work. But uh, cer certainly, you could tie them down in certain ways to make them more precise. It was very clear what exactly you were saying when you say uh, such and such a organization believes this and wants that. And then you get to say, this is going to happen in turn. So um, I'm happy with that. Um, and uh, well, it sounds like you're going to accuse me of uh, either uh, getting into trouble or denying scientific realism by saying something like that. But I, all I would say is these are not the same concepts we use in attributing beliefs and desires to each other. And if you think about the way it works with each other, you know, any, any belief you attribute to somebody involves a number of concepts. And possession of these concepts is really a pretty complicated thing. And we're completely indifferent to it in the context of these sort of um, terms that are introduced in the context of a theory where they define fairly precisely. So, you know, if you say a firm believes that uh, wants to paint its new headquarters red, for example, and on that basis you predict that it's going to paint its new headquarters red or something like that, well, I mean, there's a concept of red there, which, you know, whatever you think the property is, it's bound up with, you know, the phenomenal experience of uh, things as red. And so you can't have that concept unless you have phenomenal experience. But you don't want to attribute to the corporation phenomenal experience. So we're obviously not, you know, playing by the same rules when we say those things as we do with ordinary uh, uh, individuals when you attribute police and desires to them. So I just say, you know, you've got a theoretical concept there. Uh, the, the theory in which it appears gives you the content of the concept. And the, and the danger is that you'll think because it's the same word, it's the same concept that we use when we attribute beliefs and desires to individuals. So that's the response to the last thing. I was just wondering whether um, uh, there are cases of um, co 
collective action that uh, don't involve uh, what you would consider uh, basic actions on the part of the individuals involved. So uh, I, 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 my understanding of the logical form that you are mm -hmm. defending, it's like you know, there's this one event and multiple agents, uh, m multiple individuals are agents of that event. And how is that cashed out? Well, each individual is mm -hmm. an agent of right. his or her own action. Right. And then that individual action along with all, all these other individual actions somehow. And, uh, uh, and, and is that absolutely necessary? I mean, might it be that each individual is, you know, the subject of some kind of movement <laughs> that we would not really consider an action, right? Um, but together they constitute uh, a collective action. I mean, is that just a kind of possibility on your view, uh, or is it a possibility that you would rule out for other consideration besides? It's ruled out in my view. Yeah. On what grounds? Uh, well, so as I say, you know, I build up the story about plural action sentence from starting with the individual action sentences, and individual action sentences, the matrix come out comes out with the full you know, putting more in than I did, uh, anybody has in this uh, discussion so far. Um, there's some event E and some event F where E is the consequent event and F is an event which is the event of which the agent is a primitive agent. So whenever we do anything, there's something we do but not by doing anything else. That's the primitive action. Um, such that uh, the, um, the subject is an agent of F at a certain time and F brings about E in a certain way determined by the action verb and only the subject is an agent of um, E in that way, that is, performs any primitive action at any time such that it bears that particular relation to E, and then it's whatever the, the event type that the action verb expresses. Okay, so that's what goes on in the individual case. Now, when I get to the plural action case, you know, the thing that really, in the distributive reading, of course, the same thing, except you just have quantifier remembers a group out in the front. And then uh, there's an ambiguity, which you completely explain as a scope ambiguity, something you would expect once you've got the view that there are these event quantifiers and the distributed quantifier. And then, moreover, it looks like uh, whenever those conditions that are expressed by this, giving the event quantifier, the consequent event qu quantifier, a wide scope are met, then it, the corresponding action sentence is true. So it looks like it's necessary and sufficient, and it's motivated by this rejection of the uh, logical form singular action sentence of the plural case. But then if you look at that logical form, it says that there's some event, such as each one of us, is such that there's some event of which he or she is a primitive agent, and so on. So that's where it comes from. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just a quick follow-up. I mean, how would you handle the um, case uh, of the, the following uh, institutional action sentence? So the Lund University awards you a PhD degree. Yeah. Um, now, it's clear that there are lots of individuals who are members of Lund University who have to do various things for, for this to happen. But at the same time, if we take the action of awarding the, the degree, it would seem that the agent is properly described as, as Lund University, because it's, it's not the vice chancellor or the president or rector who can award the degree, nor can a professor award the degree, nor can a student, nor can an administrator award the degree. It really does seem to be the corporate entity. So that, that that's the kind of case which perhaps also connects up with, with the earlier um, uh, um, question, yeah. uh, where it's, it's not really clear that we want to locate the most basic actions at the level of the individuals, rather than saying the degree award is, a, is an action that is performed only by the corporate entity. Yeah. Well, you know, without trying to tell the whole story, um, and in the count of institutional agency, institutions very often perform actions through people who are designated to play certain roles. And we don't say that, so we often say that, you know, the group does something when someone is the one who actually seems to perform the action. That's a funny kind of thing. A spokesperson example. Someone who's, you know, the president who signs the diploma, right, and now it's official is another example. Uh, now when, when individuals, individual agents who are members of an institution do something like that, we often say then the institution did something not that individual. So that's the point you're making. Now, um, this is an instance of a phenomenon I call proxy agency, where someone is authorized to do something on behalf of an institution. 
And you know, to make a long story sh short, I argue that once you understand how that functions, it turns out, in fact, that everyone uh, who's a member of the institution, uh, his or her agency is expressed in a certain way in what's done through these agents. Okay, so that's the short answer, but it, you know, in that form, it's not going to be fully satisfying because you need to hear how it goes and how you respond to various natural objections to that. But that's, that's the idea. Okay, we have two more questions before we have to finish. Stephen back up here. Thank you. So I guess this is more of an observation. I'm trying to sort of start a fight here. So and it's inspired by this comment that Raymond made that, that, that Kirk is sort of working in the tradition of Bratman. And in a way, I think that's, that's entirely wrong and that's sort of been brought out by the discussion you just had with Abe. And, and here's the thought, right? So on a view like Bratman's on many people's views in this room, there's something like shared agency or shared intention, which is a thing to be explained, right? Whereas I take it on your view, there isn't, right? So a collective intentional action is just a collective action, perfectly common or garden thing, which bears a certain relation to a certain kind of intention. And that's all there is to it, right? So there isn't anything to be explained there. There isn't a kind of shared intention or a shared agency kind of phenomenon. And that seems to me a radical departure. It seems to me there's two really very different ways of thinking about the phenomena involved here. And this is surely why there's so much disagreement between you and the other panelists hiding there because for you you know there's collective action and 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 that's something that that can exist there can be all kind of causes for it so so a, a train's arrival can be the cause of a collective action lighting up the platform or whatever right uh, and so can an intention and that's all there is to it so first of all I think I'm right that there is this kind of radical difference and secondly I want to hear from some of the panelists why they think that there is something more to be explained what constrains that what constrains that phenomenon? So this seems like a really fundamental challenge for me. What is it that gives us a grip on the shared agency, shared intention, we intention, whatever it is that's still outstanding that still needs to be explained? Right? Yeah. I have a quick question. Uh -huh. so, um, and it actually it connects okay. up with this, I think. But when you gave the Roomba example, which I love, Michael and I are going to go the opposite. So I want you to think about your Roomba case, but is that how you pronounce it? Rumba? Like the... Anybody? Okay, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Rumba. Oh, whatever, the rumba. <laughs> but instead of the notes passing in the plan and all that good stuff, no notes pass. They see each other from across the room, you know, and they just start dancing the rumba. Yeah. And uh, on my view, that would be an intentional collective action, too. Uh -huh. I, I think that, that could fit with Michael's view as well, because they... They've signaled somehow, right? That's what you're thinking was missing. Even if, the, uh, no, even if they, even if you strip, away, I'm trying to strip it even more so. Okay. Okay. And um, where it doesn't even get your planned stuff. Uh -huh. So it's even more stripped. Um, somehow we just find ourselves on the dance floor and boom, we're dancing the rumba. Rumba, yeah, whatever. So it okay. seems like this is a, I mean, Mike would be disgusted by that view. <laughs> And, and I'm friendly to that view, which makes us a middle ground, actually. And you should s resist this, my view. Why? But because you problem? require the some kind of planny stuff in there. Don't, for don't they intend to dance the rumba together? They just do. I just think that there are these cases where you just do. Without intentions at all? <laughs> that's, that's we'll, we'll, also talk, we'll, no. we'll talk about it later, but like without a, a collective intention <clears throat> at all in any ordinary sense. Huh, okay. But anyway, okay. You're right, an abomination. Abomination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's actually also more like uh, my view in this. I think there might be an intention in the technical sense that is, if you talk about motor intentions, or, uh, so, but not in the ordinary sense. So I think like they might be dancing intentionally in the sense that there's a joint sons remote action and they coordinate it and so on and I think that's partly what you uh, had in that's part of the phenomena so I think there's a part of phenomenon that's to be understood on the sense remote level independently of conceptual level propositional attitudes and states which are the uh, results of planning and, and things like that yeah, so so I would make distinction there whereas I understood you as saying you basically like a propositionalist or conceptualist and thinks all intentional action that can be understood in terms of um, conceptually and propositionally articulated. 
well, states. I, I don't want you to yeah. stick something on me that I don't believe. Of course, but, you know, there are lots of, as we were, motor routines yeah. and you know, infrastructure for action, right? That's but there. there's a special, in, special infrastructure for joint action. That's the point. That oh, we, are, we have well, special. Well, there could be that as well. Yeah. But, uh, but that's. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, and all sorts of mechanisms that could be at work there, you know, you know some kind of mirroring. Cognitive modeling. But that wouldn't be really something really intentional on your view. No, no, that could be, you know, s the substructure. It could be there even though you don't act intentionally with other people. I mean, you know, when the zebra is trying to get away from the lion, right, it's doing that too. But it doesn't mean <laughs> they're doing anything together, right? Uh, so all that stuff can be invoked even though you're not jointly intentionally doing things together. And what do you need in addition to that? Well, you need, you know, this traditional picture where, you know, there, there's a motivation. Uh, you know, one of these motivations gets promoted to the point where it can affect action, and that just is what it is to have an intention. Okay, last question, Matthias. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will try to be brief. I know that everybody wants to go to the reception and have wine and beer and <laughs> non-alcoholic beverages and things <laughs> like that. Uh, it's about a, a small footnote at the end of the book which I think it's not that small, actually. <laughs> None of them are small. <laughs> no. <laughs> but you, uh, when you look at your, first you have this collective action, collective in intention, and then you put these together to collective intentional action. And the collective action is something like, there is an event that is brought about by multiple agents. Sure. And the collective intentions is it's kind of the intention, each agent the intents to bring about this event according to a shared plan. And for there to be a collective intentional action, both these uh, requirements have, have to be satisfied. I think there could be ca some cases where they aren't. For instance, I say, say that you have five people are going to shoot some poor bastard, uh, and they share a plan to do this, um, and they carry out this plan, but the thing is that there is a sixth shooter hidden somewhere mm -hmm. in a forest right. nearby who shoots at the same time. Mm -hmm. So suddenly there are different groups that bring about this event. You have the group of six people bring about the event and the group of five people share a plan. So I'm just wondering what, what, what would you say happen in those cases? Yeah, so is there, right. a there, is, there is a footnote that's exactly about that kind of case. It was suggested by Michael Bratman in comments on the book. So, um, well, you know, so I say what I say in the footnote, which is that if you think it through, who did it? It wasn't, you know, the guys there who, you know, five guys. Uh, suppose, you know, it's a firing squad. Uh, is that the example I use? So, you know, five guys think they're going to kill this guy, but there's someone else back there who is also shooting him at the same time. And you ask, uh, so what was the group that killed the guy? Is it just these five? No, it's actually all, all six of them, right? Uh, and if you don't say that, then you're going to say, well, each of them individually killed him all by himself, but that's wrong. So you've got to go to the maximal group that participated in uh, killing him by shooting him. Uh, and you ask, well, what did these five guys intend to do? They intended that they should be the ones who kill him, but they weren't. So the intention wasn't satisfied, so they didn't do it together intentionally. Yeah. I think that people want to leave now. <laughs> 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 so I shouldn't follow up with a, with a follow -up.